Well, probably ought to get started. Uh, as you could tell, my name is Todd Hatfield with HECO Industrial Service Groups. I'm uh, Vice President of Engineering and Repair. Been involved with the company from the time that about 1980 all the way to now. Graduated from college in 1985, electrical engineering. Uh, from that point, I was involved. We had a coil manufacturing division, HECO Coil. Was involved with that, managing that, and managing uh, the uh, repair facility and doing engineering. So, kind of had did a lot of things over a period of time. Um, but my background primarily now is repairing, solving problematic motor designs, improving motor designs, uh, giving customers ideas on how to take a problematic motor and make it better. And most of the time being able to do that with the existing motor. Uh, the most commonly misunderstood on the nameplate. Uh, the nameplate's interesting because there's a lot of information there on the nameplate and a lot of people don't understand what the information really says and, and then maybe misapply the motor. Um, not necessarily the RPM, but just basically the RPM. The RPM is, is defined by this formula down here. You've got the 100, you've got 120 times the frequency, in this case 60 hertz would be 720. If it's a four pole machine, it's gonna be 1800 RPM. That's the synchronous RPM. To calculate what the slip RPM is, you have to use this other formula. I'm not gonna go into that because you can do the math. By the way, anybody that wants a copy of the presentation, remind me at the end. I have no problem providing you an email copy of this presentation. That way you don't have to worry about all these formulas and numbers. Um, basic operating speeds, it goes beyond this. But based on the number of poles, two pole is 3,600, a four pole is 1,800, a six pole is 1,200. Full load uh, speed RPM is gonna be slightly less. Remember I talked about earlier that the motor, the rotor is lagging, I think I said this, behind the stator. So there's a slip uh, involved, what we're talking about below here. So, just a representation, but to produce torque and induction motor, current must flow in the rotor. To produce the current flow in the rotor, the rotor must be slightly slower than synchronous speed. The difference between synchronous speed and the rotor speed is called slip, and it's calculated by that formula. Uh, service factor, another kind of a misunderstood piece of information on the nameplate. Service factor is a multiplier that can be applied to the horsepower or to the amperage of the motor to give you a way of allowing that motor to be intermittently overloaded. What happens in real life though is people will apply, they'll say I've got a 30 horse with a 115, doesn't that mean I can just run it continuously at 35 horsepower? No. You can, but what you've got to recognize is that the motor is going to run hotter and I haven't said it yet, but I'll say it, every 10 degrees C rise in temperature of the motor winding results in cutting the winding life in half. So that's not necessarily what you wanna do, but also can be answering why some applications have repetitive failures that people haven't figured out. And then when you get all the information, sometimes you have this situation. Insulation class, NEMA defines the insulation classes A, B, F, and H. A isn't used anymore, B really isn't used. You still see those machines out. It's typically F and H today, and then there's some other classes, but those are the typical in their temperature classes. NEMA also defines the ambient, and more or less there have been some variations, but in the United States, we define the hottest ambient to be 40 degrees C and then the motor temperature rise would add above that. It's just a way of defining it and, and also designing a motor around the insulation system. So <clears throat> ambient, ambient consists of not just the outside air temp or the room temp, but anything else that's in that room that could be causing heat, that could elevate the heat of the motor and actually raise the ambient. So 
the, what we're just trying to show here is those other things beyond the motor, the bearings, the, the driven equipment, the things that are causing additional heat, all of those can impact the motor. And, you know, the example again, if you're operating at a 30 degree ambient with 240,000 calculated hours of operation, if you operate at a 40 degree ambient, you're gonna cut it in half. And believe it or not, that rule of thumb works out fairly well. It may not be exactly right, but the point to be made is when a motor operates hotter for some reason, it's gonna last, it's gonna have a shortening of its life. Temperature rise will, uh, and a motor will happen as soon as it's started. What, what's misunderstood here is that you have the temperature rise that motor will rise that temperature rise based on the nameplate. Let's say it's 80 degrees C or 105 C in this example. It, it will rise 105 C at full load regardless of the ambient. So if it's zero, it will rise 105 C. If it's 20 degrees C, 68 F, it will rise 105 over that temperature. So you have to add the ambient back to the rise to get the total maximum temperature that that motor would operate at. The designer does this and you have to leave a margin for the maximum insulation temperature. Let's say in this case, it's 155 degrees C class F and you design the motor to not get any higher than 145 and you're leaving a 10 degrees C gap to the maximum insulation. A better design would make that gap even larger, but today a lot of the designs are running this close. This is just kind of showing you how NEMA defines uh, that gap, that hot spot temperature that we're talking about. And on a class H, they're giving about a 15 degree. One of the things that I look at as an opportunity when we're rewinding motors is to improve that. And a lot of times with designs, we can actually improve that by increasing the copper cross-sectional area. Increasing the copper cross-sectional area causes the temperature to go down. It also slightly increases the efficiency, but things you can do that can help the situation. Again, for every 10 degrees C increase, you decrease the winding of light by 50%. NEMA designs. NEMA design on the nameplate is essentially saying the torque characteristic design of that motor in NEMA frames. And the efficiency is stated here, and we'll go into a little more detail. Um, locked rotor KVA, another very much misunderstood. Uh, this information that's on the nameplate is really valuable, but I find time and time again that people don't understand what it means. But what it essentially gives you is the ability to know where the inrush current is going to fall on this motor design. You don't see it in the code letter G, but in the next example, you'll see where I'm heading. There are charts and information you can go to, and you can actually pick the code letter and then rework this formula so that you're calculating the locked amps and you get a locked amp range for that motor design. It's a valuable piece of information. You, one thing to know, you can't just randomly, if it's a design or a um, NEMA code D, change it with a code E. You might be able to, but you can run into danger doing that because the inrush current is gonna be higher. The controls might not be able to handle it. The motor might produce that 100, 200, 500 horsepower, whatever it is, once it's up to speed, but it might not get up to speed because it gets tripped by the breaker that you can't adjust. So just things you have to pay attention to, and believe it or not, have happened many times. Operating characteristics, torque curves, NEMA design, some of the things we've just talked about, but being able to see that beyond the nameplate. So typical speed torque curve. Um, they'll vary in shape and size, but you always have a breakaway or lock rotor torque at zero starting point. As a motor accelerates, some people call it accelerating torque or the pull-up torque, it's in this range. You'll have a breakdown or a maximum torque value, and then you'll have full load torque. Typical speed torque curve can be shaped differently on 
all different designs, but this is a typical shape. Uh, definitions, a locked rotor torque being the, the maximum torque at standstill. Um, so it's minimum torque, but it's also the maximum torque it's going to produce at standstill. Pull-up torque is that accelerating torque. That can cause issues if you don't apply the motor right and the pull-up torque dips down below what the load requires. Um, breakdown torque is the torque that we talked about over here. And then the relationship of torque, horsepower times 5250 divided by RPM. So NEMA designs, A, B, C, and D. Uh, the stator, we talked about this earlier, really has little to do with the shape of the speed torque curve. It's the rotor that actually uh, causes the shape of the curve and the characteristic torques of the motor. Um, but again, only applied to NEMA frames. So Siemens and Westinghouse and Toshiba and whoever manufacture, if they design them and they say design B or design C, in a NEMA frame, you can be pretty confident that the torque characteristic is gonna fall in a range that you can swap that 100 horsepower for that other 100 horsepower. When you get out of the NEMA frames, you can't do that. Uh, the NEMA frame uh, speed torque curves, I'm sorry. You've got uh, design D, you've got design C, and then you've got A and B. The most common is design B. Design B can handle most applications. It's the most common you're gonna see out there. But to give you an example of the characteristics, you know, the locked rotor torque gets a little higher on a design D. Design D motors are for high peak loads uh, with punch presses, flywheels, with or without elevators, wenches, hoists, where you need that extra torque. Uh, design B is your typical conveyor, crusher, stirring, agitator, pumps, and so on. Um, you can make a mistake by, in the NEMA frames, by misapplying this 125 horse B design B to a 125 horse original D, that would be a mistake in most applications. So motor starting considerations, the torque is proportional to the voltage squared. This is kind of a, uh, a good piece of information because you might think, well, my voltage is only 90% of rated voltage. That's typical to have a 10% drop, especially on start. Not uncommon, but what you need to recognize is that you're only gonna have about 81% torque available because the voltage is less and it's the square of the voltage difference that impacts the torque. The current is proportional to voltage. Won't go into great detail in that yet, um, but the uh, acceleration time of the motor, you can calculate with this formula. Acceleration, uh, is dependent upon the inertia of the load, the inertia of the rotor, the two combined, and then the volts applied, and how long does that motor take to come up to speed.